we create the problem. So it's all ages, all experience levels, and in an ideal fix it clinic, everyone's just helping everybody else out to fix stuff. Here's one of our larger events. We had 150 people come to this fix it clinic. And so it's hands on. This is a laptop where the display was flickering, and we were all working together. We have the volunteer fix it coaches who work with the owner of the item to try and do the troubleshooting and, and figure out what's wrong with it. And at some level, you know, the, the repair is actually a serendipitous side effect of the whole thing. What we're really trying to do is convey this kind of critical thinking skills and, uh, to, to the general public so that everyone's fixing all the time, whether there's a fix it clinic or not. Another reason why we have people do their own repair is because we're transferring knowledge. We're hoping that people will, will do this stuff and understand once they fix it themselves, that they know they, they can open it up again and fix it if it breaks again. And hopefully they'll tell their neighbors and friends how to do that. <laughs> so I'm always joking, we see a lot of toasters and people, I always say, well, did you bring bread so we can test it after we fix it? And so this particular event, while the wife was fixing the toaster, the husband went out and bought some bread at the supermarket so that we could confirm that, yes, indeed, the toaster did work. It's community building as well. People from all walks of life come to these. We group people together to fix things that are like things. So in this case, three radios. We love it when families come. We love the intergenerational learning. There's this sense that People used to fix a lot more than they fix now, and so maybe these people's parents fixed, and they want to transfer that knowledge to their children, and we always like to support that. Here's another one with a whole family diving into the pair of the toaster. And surprisingly, kids younger than you would think are showing a lot of acumen in the ability to repair. In this case, he's replacing the display on uh, iPod Touch. Uh, this is an older teenager repairing a Samsung phone for a younger teenager that had to do a board repair. Uh, this is a seventh grader who's fixing smartphones. So this is very possible. We hold a lot of fix-it clinics at the major colleges and universities because the next generation of designers and engineers see this as a great opportunity to see how design for manufacturing occurs now. So they, they get to open up things that the general public brings, they get to see how they're going bad, and they get to then use that to hopefully inform them in the future. So we are trying with this effort to make sure that the next generation of designers and engineers knows how to design for durability, maintainability, serviceability, and repairability from the get-go. But we've got one at Harvard in two weeks. So how do you do this? All right, modern consumer electronics are really complicated. And remember, we're doing this without access to manufacturer service manuals. Uh, we're doing this without access to um, you know, any sort of repair parts or, or schematics or anything. How do, how do we even begin to, to take apart? How do we begin to, to take this apart? So the first thing is obviously we try and research the problem on the internet. And with certain devices that have been around a long time, you're lucky. There's, there's a long tail of information on the internet about how to address the kind of problem that you might be facing at that moment. Um, this is this kind of KitchenAid mixer. This, pretty much, this, is, this design has pretty much been around for about 20 or 30 years, and everybody knows how to fix them. And there's exploding diagrams, there's a deep well of spare parts available. We're usually pretty successful with something like this if we have the background information. All right, I'm gonna go into some specific things right now that we see. So we see a lot of toasters. Okay, can you guys see what's wrong with this toaster? Here we go. The, the, the element, the nichrome wire on the element is broken. Okay, what do you think happened here? Probably someone was trying to get out a piece of bread, they put a fork or a knife in it, they, they broke the nichrome wire. Okay, in this case, we can fix it. We have wire crimps. So you recrimp the two connections back together, works. But you also speak to the idea that we see this a lot. So in all the years that we've been building toasters, how would we get back to the manufacturers to say, this is a common failure mode, that the customer, the user, is going to stick a fork or a knife into the toaster at some point. How do you fix it? How do you address that going forward? So, so we'd love to get this kind of information back. 
Okay, here's another toaster, breaking the night from wire. But this time, it's deep in the toaster. It's way down in a place where a customer couldn't, or a user couldn't have, have put a fork there. It's there. So in this situation, it looks to us like it's a manufacturing defect. It looks as if the nichrome wire was, was bent too quickly around that attachment point, and it caused it to fail and break at that place. OK, so we'd love to understand how many toasters were made with this defect. Is this the only one? Was, this, was it a whole production run of these toasters? Is this still going on today on a regular basis? We don't really know. But we'd love to be able to get that information back to people. Okay. This is very common, batteries leak in battery compartments. And a lot of people see this and just think, oh, it's ruined, I have to throw it out. But if you clean it up with um, steel wool and vinegar, you can make it bright and shiny like it is on the right-hand side again. Another thing, if it's so bad and corroded that the, the, the metal has actually worn away, you can use aluminum foil and or take a paper clip and fashion some sort of new way to establish connectivity with the battery. In this case, she did everything right. She bought the, the new um, battery for the phone, but that means for the iPod Touch, but it's deep inside the device. It's really hard to get to it, and once you get to it, it's glued in, and a battery is something that's a fairly common thing that goes bad. So, you know, we should be able to replace batteries more easily than we had to when we did this fix. Laptop displays, sometimes we can get the display for a reasonable price, sometimes we can't. It's a reasonable, high-value item that we'd like to be able to replace the screen on, and we do it on a regular basis. Optical drives. 90% of the time, the problem is that somebody put a fingerprint there's some sort of dirt or debris on the lens. So you use a Q-tip with alcohol to clean that off, you're good to go. If that doesn't fix it, the next thing is that it gets stuck in this motorized track and won't, won't move back and forth. So just nudge that a little bit inside the track, it works again. Multi-changers, <laughs> this uh, optical drives are a different problem. These things are very complicated and fiddly. And, and they come in many different versions. So often we just really can't do much with these. It's possible some little plastic piece broke up inside or something here or here. When we see these, we struggle. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. There's no regular way to know. Okay, let's look at some other things that go on. This is pretty obvious in the old age, okay? This wire is probably 50 years old. That's, that's reasonable and expectation for end of life for, for that. For that. And if you just replace the wire, you're fine. This wire was chewed by a cat. So that's damage. So that's, there's really not much you can do about that. I'm not saying that we should get armored cable for all sorts of household wires just because a cat chews the one every now and then. Replace that, it works. These people came in and said, our microphone, our microwave makes a bad smell when we use it. And I'm looking at them, I'm going, that's amazing that they didn't see it, so they put the whole thing like that in, and I'll have a blow up. They had no idea that the plug was basically melting away into the extension cord. So, so just that sort of observational technique to, to look at things like that. Okay. Lamps. We rewire a lot of lamps, and the lesson to be told here is that the nice thing about lamps is that they haven't been a standard for good 75 years. The standard's enforced by the threading, the bulb size and the bulb threading, which is, this is the US standard for bulb size and threading. And what this allows is that you have both backward compatibility and upgradability. Okay, so as we've moved through technologies, as we've moved from incandescent lamps, incandescent bulbs, to compact fluorescent bulbs, to LED bulbs, and now we have smart LED bulbs, that all of them will be backward compatible with all the lamps of this type that have been built in the last 75 years. That's great. That speaks to really sort of great, you know, think about sort of how standards enforce that kind of timelessness to a device. Okay. US plugs are designed in a way that people don't pull them from the plug, they pull them from the wire. So we see this all the time, and you know, wires should be better reinforced in the places people are going to use them. 
But, you know, if we're thinking about the user-centric design and thinking about how the user is going to use your item, when we sell an extension cord, we should think about making it more durable at this point. Here's another one where it failed, obviously not enough reinforcement, but so bad we can actually visually see that the wire had gone bad. This one, we couldn't tell. We, we actually opened the toaster three or four times trying to figure out what was wrong with it and why we couldn't get power to it before we finally did figure out that it was the plug. So is there something we can do about this? Well, this is the plug I've seen that I like a lot. Okay, if you think about sort of user-centric design, this plug is super well reinforced. It comes out at an angle, so it discourages you from, from, from pulling it out from the cord. And it has these nice little finger grips so that you can pull it out. It, it encourages, you, encourages you to do the right thing. Headphone wires are really too small. We use them all the time. They, they don't just break at the earbuds themselves, but they also break somewhere in the, in the headphones. I have a pair of mine that I liked. It was durable wire, but it still failed at the end here. But rather than trying to do this kind of difficult, fiddly sovereign job, I basically just hot glued the end of it in a way that would secure it so that uh, it would always work. So you can come up with this later. Microwave ovens. So it's rarely the magnetron or the transformers or the, or the, uh, the big capacitor that goes bad. What goes bad are the safety interbox switches. So in the door, there are a bunch of these switches normally open, normally closed, but they're trying to guarantee that the door of the microwave is closed, fully closed, so that the microwave energy doesn't leak out. These switches go bad. A lot of current goes through these switches. And when they do, uh, you know, the, the, the microwave won't work anymore. So I talked about that idea that we never let the person, uh, we let the person's story, we let them tell it. They will tell us, well, if the, for a long time I could make the microwave work by holding the door in in the corner. That tells us everything we need to know. So the other nice thing is this part, this subcomponent, is well documented. Okay, look at all the documentation on that part. So we can go to eBay, look up those numbers, order another one, get the microwave working again. So you have a $200, $300 device that's, that would otherwise be thrown away because of the $5 part. Here's the printer. Look what's happened. The USB jack has come out. From the, from the actual circuit board inside. So what can we do here? So if this little USB jack had documentation like that switch I just showed, maybe we could order another one to try and re-secure it to the board. But there are hundreds or thousands of these different types of USB jacks. That's really hard. It's hard to figure out which one that is. And so in this particular case, what we told the person, luckily there was Ethernet and there was Wi-Fi. We told them to use Wi-Fi. Here's another situation. This is a Bluetooth speaker, and the USB 3 port, sorry, the micro USB port has come off the surface mount. It's, it's lost from the pads and maybe broken too. Once again, there are hundreds or thousands of different types of these. We can't order another one, and even if we could order another one, we can't solder it back at the moment onto the pads on this board. Now, on the good side, they did make it into an order board. They made it into a separate auxiliary board where all the ports, all the parts they thought human beings would connect to, are there. And I bought a couple more of these as examples. You can see later. Uh, other devices, which this is good design to basically have this sort of a daughter board type of thing set up. So that you know the places where human beings are going to interact with it, those are small and easily replaceable. Okay, I'm going to go through three major failure modes of a bunch of consumer electronics. Very, uh, and, and just as examples, there are more, but I just chose three for this. So here's, here's a space heater. And when you open it up, there's a thermal fuse inside. The thermal fuse is designed to, to break if uh, basically the, the heater gets above a certain temperature. So if that goes bad, you replace it, it starts working again. So this is in there because it's trying to make sure that the, doesn't make, the space heater doesn't make the whole house catch on fire. And sure enough, what this guy admitted to was that he had some curtains near the space heater, and when the space heater was running, the curtains restricted the airflow, so the air inside the, the space heater went, went up in temperature and triggered the, triggered the 
through the thermal fuse. Okay, so he made this mistake. Does that mean that the, the, the space heater should never work again? That he has to open it up and understand there's a thermal fuse inside? Coffee maker. It doesn't work. So take it apart, and there's a heating element in the bottom there, that horseshoe shaped piece there. Thermal fuse. Okay, we, we had cut it, we were about to replace it, but I said, let's take a picture of it first. So you replace it, it works again. What caused this thermal fuse to, 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 to fail? I don't know, but, but somehow we thought it was too hot and stopped. This is a rice cooker. In the bottom of the rice cooker, there's this metal disc. When you put down the rice container, there's a metal disc in the middle. At the top of that metal disc, thermal fuse. So, if we could just figure out some way not to have these thermal fuses go, and they're not just in those sorts of devices. So there's the resistive element heating devices like those. There's the space heaters, the hot water makers, there's the coffee makers, there's the griddles, there's the um, waffle makers, but they're also in small motor appliances. So in, even inside this coffee grinder, there's a, a motor, and deep, nestled in next to the motor windings is a thermal fuse. It's very hard to get to, but that's the reason why, and, and in this case, the person was trying to grind chocolate, and the chocolate was really gummy, so it caused the motor to bind up, and that's why it overheated. But why should a one-time thermal fuse flow and make, it, make the device inoperable? Well, some hair dryers and space heaters have a resettable thermal fuse, and I brought one, and you can look at it later, down, the, down there in here, there's a resettable thermal fuse, I think all devices should have that as an alternative. You should not use a one-time uh, thermal fuse, you should use a resettable one. It's basically a bimetallic element. When it gets too hot, it pulls away, shuts down the device. You leave the device alone for 10 or 15 minutes, it cools off, restores connectivity. Okay, so that class of resistive element heating devices, the heaters, the hot water makers, the toasters, same class of items, different problem. Problem number two. An electric hot water maker where the button won't stay down. Okay, or a toaster where the toaster button won't stay down. Very common problem. So before we go on to what that problem is, the first thing is when you try to open it up, there's special screws inside. There's some it's like they're using triangle head screws or security torch screws. They're not using common Phillips screws. This is just a common household computer that comes through our appliance. Why make it difficult? Why use a special fastener to keep the thing uh, keep the thing together. Okay, so here's the problem. These tabs here, there are these two contact points. And if they're not touching perfectly, they tend to arc over time. Here's another example here and here. Hopefully you can see it. So, over, so when you press that button down, those two contact points come together, and they, all the current going to the heating element goes through those contact points. And so if they're not perfectly aligned, over time they arc. And, and as arcing over time, they build up carbon, and then they start to fail. And you get to a point finally where they can't draw any current through it, and it just gives up, and that causes the device to fail. So you can do two things. You can take an emery board, and you can rub it through there, shine it up, it will work again. But the other thing I'm going to make a case for is as manufacturers, we should figure out how to make this device better. We should make it so that the tolerances in this are a little better so that we don't, so that this happens less, much less frequently than it seems to happen now. Ah, the final one, electrolytic capacitors. <laughs> These fail everywhere, they're the worst. And they're just really hard to troubleshoot, especially if you don't have a schematic. Um, you can't test them in circuit. And there's something about the way these are manufactured, they just go bad and, and there was a whole generation of TVs from a famous uh, manufacturer. Every TV from the 24 inch to the 80 inch had power supplies where the capacitors were failing and it would kill the entire TV because the power supply was bad. Right. So we have one thing we can do at Fix a Clinic at the moment, which is we look for visual inspection. A bad capacitor is going to get puffy on the top. So on this device, look to the left hand side, that board on the left, and then look below the yellow transformer, right there, that capacitor is puffy. We replace that capacitor, works. Here's some more examples of puffy capacitors. 
Those two are bad. That one's bad. That one's bad. Those two are bad. So with visual inspection, lots of times we're lucky and we're able to get the capacitors and fix, fix something like that. But I don't know. Something's not right with where we're getting from you guys. Can you go back to your suppliers of these electrolytic capacitors and ask them if they can do better quality control? Can we do something that makes these things more, so that they have a much, much lower failure rate than they do now? And um, the other thing to think about is, what, what the answer was for those TV sets, for example, was the engineers decided that a 15 volt capacitor was good enough, but, but the user groups on the, you know, the internet were saying, replace them with 25 volt. So if you had a 470 microfarad 15 volt capacitor, replace it with a 25, 470 microfarad 25 volt capacitor. So for those of you designing things today in the absence of better capacitors, um, I would say overspec your capacitors. Put in, a, put in a higher voltage range of capacitors than the one you were going to put in. Okay. And then the final thing is, how do we design circuits that don't need these darn things at all? <laughs> and how do we basically engineer out the, the electrolytic capacitor out of everything that we, that we choose to build going forward? Okay, so now I'm going to give three examples of um, manufacturers behaving badly. Right? Printer manufacturers do all these things. Their model, their business model, is to sell you the printer cheap and then make money on the ink. And so it's in their interest to have you buy as much ink as possible. And from what I can tell at this point, the diagnostics are so terrible that when you try to fix the printer, all you're doing is buying cartridges after cartridges to, to try and fix it. So uh, you know, just the diagnostics are terrible. Unless we're lucky and there's a piece of paper in the paper path or something very obvious, it's, it's really very, very hard to fix these things. And so what I, what I recommend is try and choose the printer manufacturers who uh, allow for a third-party ecosystem of inks and cartridges and toner and stuff around their devices. It's hard enough to fix an iPhone. Why does Apple have to create yet another proprietary screw so that you can't get inside the phone. Okay? This, is, this is totally nuts. And so as things become more a combination of hardware and software, we're getting this issue going now where you know, it's not just about the fact that they're trying to lock down the hardware, but for all of us now, Apple, for example, stopped supporting the iPhone 5 and the iPhone 6 with, uh, sorry, iPhone 4 and iPhone 5 with security updates. That means that anyone who wants to keep using an iPhone 4 or an iPhone 5 is going to be vulnerable to basically, you know, their, their personal information could be vulnerable. They could uh, basically be, be, you know, in a situation where their phone could get taken over to be some sort of zombie spam bot on the internet. So there just speaks this whole nature of ownership. What does it mean to own something? You bought it, you use it. Shouldn't you, if you own it, shouldn't you have a right to upgrade it or to, to, to fix it from, from both a hardware and a software perspective? If some third party wanted to come out with a version of the iOS operating system that applied all the latest security patches, you can't load it onto your iPhone 4 or iPhone 5 because Apple has locked the bootloader. There is no way to get to, to, to use the phone, okay? The phone is going to be end of life slowly because Apple wanted to, not because you wanted to. Final example of manufacturers behaving badly. This is the famous Xbox 360 Red Ring of Death. Does anybody know about this problem? So basically they had an issue where the graphics chip on the Xbox 360s, something was wrong with the way it was attached to the motherboard. The only way to fix it was to open up the machine and put a heat gun, oh, shield the one part, shield the rest of the components, so that you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't damage them. Take a heat gun like you would use to spray paint, blast the heck out of it, and reflow the solder underneath the graphics chip. So for, uh, the, the community found out about this, and the community was saying, this is the way you fix it. Apple, for a long time, denied there was a problem. They were, and basically what happened over time, they finally fessed up. They added a three-year warranty to the Xbox 360. They fixed a lot of them. I got one fixed by them uh, this way. But how many people in the interim you know, ended up throwing it away or, or you know, not, not being paid for professional repair or something like that for a device that was just basically a lemon? All right, so this is my one text slide. Sums up everything I've said so far. Okay? Support the new standards. Reveal your sourcing. Let us know where those little tiny parts come from so we can replace them when they break. 
Support and repair documentation, whether it comes from your factory, from your engineers, or it comes from the user community, okay? Help create service panels so that people can really bring your stuff, all right? Batteries should be easily replaceable. Don't use glues or adhesives, okay? Design away from those one-time thermal fuses. I've got some examples here if you want to see what these thermal fuses look like. They put in resettable thermal fuses. Okay. Better quality control over on electronic capacitors. Wires should have modular connections on all the ends. Use standard connecting tools of standard screws. Don't use fancy screws. Um, make any ports, or places where ports come in, be heavily reinforced and easily replaceable. Okay, eschew the razor, razor blade business model. Don't try to sell people the inks just because that's where you make your money. And be open and honest with your customers. So I showed this slide before about a lot of people basically understand that what we're doing on the planet now is unsustainable. We've got to slow down this churn process. We've got to keep things at the highest utility possible for as long as possible. And there's this idea of repair as being this revolutionary act, this militant act. But you know, this old photograph of nuns doing radio repair shows that you know, this is fairly common. And there are whole industries, there are whole places where we expect to be able to do our own repair. Farmers have always done their own repair. And it's part of being, uh, you know, it's part of being a resilient society. And, and being able to sort of be able to fix stuff yourself, understand it enough to fix it. But a modern John Deere tractor is uh, sold to you if you're an American farmer, you have to sign a service agreement that only John Deere can service it. It's such a combination of hardware and software that at this point they're nervous and they don't want you to, to get access to their proprietary software and they're just basically saying the only way to fix it is to come to us. And in a, in a modern society with all this technology, we need to figure out how to address that. I mean, for this person, maybe yes, their family photos are on this computer, but maybe their access to banking is on this computer. Maybe their Bitcoin is on this computer. There, there's a way in which these things are, are permeating our lives that we need the kind of tech literacy that Fix a Clinic uh, conveys on all aspects of it. This stuff is going to the landfill prematurely because all these smartphones have so much wonderful capability in them, okay? They've got a touch screen, they've got GPS, they've got a USB port, they've got all these wonderful things that can be repurposed in other ways rather than just throwing them away. This is another thing that's coming down the pipe. Okay? So lithium ion batteries are only now becoming a small part of the waste stream. But when they are thrown away, if they get damaged, they can go into the thermal runaway and combust. All right, here's a great video. But, so what's happening now is that all over the United States, and probably in your countries too, in garbage facilities, all of a sudden they're having these fires you know, in the garbage trucks and in the garbage facilities because these batteries are in there and they're getting crushed. Here's an example. This is a bigger, oh, it's a bigger lithium ion battery than one in a cell phone, but you get the idea that this is, this is a major problem. Uh, our, in the United States, we've had two major fires already. One cost $40 million, one cost $8 million, and more than the cost, the insurance underwriter said, we're not giving you insurance again. So, if you, so people's waste collection is going to be a risk. So that's why legislation is moving forward in the United States to have right to repair. This idea that there should be some basic rights that we should have in order to repair our own stuff. We bought it, we own it. And it's different from state to state. It hasn't passed anywhere yet. Apple and John Deere are fighting it like that. But that's, you know, that's sort of the trend. That's the underlying environment in which this is happening. And so I'm going to leave you with a positive note, <laughs> which is this idea that I, I talked about service not soldering before. We, we're not doing it yet, but we're starting to. There's a broader trend going on now because of what's happening with this democratization of high-tech machining. You know, the kinds of machining capability that used to be the purview of military con defense contractors only. You know, the milling machines. Everyone makes a big deal out of the 3D printers. But I'm talking about the milling machines and the, the PCB circuit board machines and the chip making and stuff. That's all getting down to a level where we might be able to do it locally. And where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're starting to experiment with this now. So for example, you know, right now this girl's doing some surface mount work at one of our fix-it clinics. Okay? 
And what this might be leading to is a different type of a vision than what we have now with factories in China making our parts. It's possible that lots of things that right now are made in remote factories could be made locally using locally available tools, materials, processes, and services. So here's an example of this PCB maker from Canada um, that can print silver solder in lines fine enough that you can do surface mount boards with it. So certainly for prototyping, but if we move to a world where most things are sort of mass customization and manufacturing on demand, this sort of thing might become more the norm. And to me, that's great, okay? To me, that empowers little kids like this to be able to think about how they can have a future, you know, where they are doing this stuff locally and, and sort of making the resilient communities for themselves. Or for my seven-year-old, uh, sorry, seventh grader who can repair smartphones. So I'm gonna close with this positive thought. So this is, this is repair from the 15th century. This is kintsugi, the Japanese art of ceramic repair, where the repaired item is considered more beautiful and more valuable than the original. Is this something that we could uh, try to attain in our civilization? So that we have less of this and more of this. Thank you very much. We actually have uh, some time for a few questions or comments. If people uh, have something that, uh, oh, well, <laughs> I've got a line here. I totally agree with you about the right of maintenance. And then I want to have a challenge to our CE community, IEEE. Don't you think when companies seize support, they should open source the designs that they sought I think we as a community we need to fight for that. I love CE. I have some products for more than 20 years. I collect all digital cameras. But then some, suddenly companies start to stop supporting them. And we are completely lost in terms of software and hardware. So I advocate that we need to ask these companies to open source the old designs for maintaining this right of maintenance. So the nice thing is that they, that might be happening whether the companies want it or not. So in our effort at colleges and universities, I'm trying to find some sort of non-threatening household appliance that we can create some sort of open source design platform for. So let's say it's the um, UC Berkeley toaster. So they were the, the college toaster that all the digital files are online, and it's designed in a way so that it can be manufactured locally, it can be serviced and maintained and upgraded locally. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'd love to be able to figure out how to do something like that. Time for just one more question, and then we'll move on. I would just like to make a substitute basic comments about the idea. I think everybody agrees that we should be able to repair. I mean, I myself get annoyed if I have something that I want to repair it. I think your documentation to do it. That's one side of it. The other side, I think, is our behavior as well, that is forcing these young repair issues. Having worked with major manufacturers, we've had customers who came back and sued us because they prepared the product themselves and did incompetent repair jobs, and then they got electric shocks, and then they wanted the company to be liable for their own incompetence. Uh, I'll give you an example. Somebody was placed a capacitor, not knowing what kind of capacitor it was, it was a safety capacitor, the capacitor was underrated, uh, the part became live. Volts. He touched it, had a shock. The next thing he did was he went and sued the company. You know, so, so the issue, what's one of the things, the problems we have with incompetent repairs. Um, in Japan, there was a statistic for the Tokyo Fire Department 17% uh, of household fires are due to consumer electronic products catching fire. In Germany, 30% of household fires due to consumer electronics catching fire because you know, bad design or repair issues. And, and the real problem is not that manufacturers don't want the products repaired. They're concerned about the safety of the product. Those products are getting so complex to do, like you're talking about surface mount soldering and all that. Uh, we can reduce so much safety issues. You know, and maybe if we sue them, like, to be much more open to, to, to um, Providing information, but the real issue is, for example, you're talking about the term of users. 
when you replace the job of youth, how do you know that your replacement is a safe replacement? Because it's not just simply taking a rating. I can take an ordinary fuse, rating, let's say, uh, 630 milliamps. I can take a similar rating from a different manufacturer. And if it's a critical design, for you as you replace the qualifier. And your question is? <laughs> OK, I think we ran out of time. <laughs> but I don't know if anybody disagrees with you. So thank you. We'll move on with the program. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Now for a few words. All right, so we have some. Uh, So we have some uh, awards we're going to be giving out. Uh, first, some uh, paper awards, some of the best paper awards. Okay, so uh, we have uh, some best paper awards. First of all, uh, one of the awards is uh, for, excuse me if I mispronounced your name, uh, Hai, let's see, Haiyong Zhang, uh, Yanyong Ju, and uh, Shinsuki uh, Kamisho. Come on up here, one of you, if, if you're here. So let's call them Hama on stage here first. Thanks. on this 
page is uh, Nirvan uh, Sengupta, uh, uh, Dai Panjan uh, Roy, and uh, Sergio uh, Mohante. Sergio, are you on here too? There's a third one here. You want that one? A different offer? Okay. Uh, oh, Nirvan uh, Sarah uh, Sengupta and uh, Dajitan Roy. So we have uh, uh, several distinguished lecturers for the IEEE, IEEE Consumer Electronics Society. Distinguished lecturers, uh, a local section chapter, like a Consumer Electronics chapter, would invite a speaker uh, from these distinguished lecturers, and the Consumer Electronics Society has helped to uh, send us these uh, lectures off to give talks at the local section. So we'd like to uh, uh, folks that have been distinguished lecturers and want to recognize them here. The first one is someone a lot of you probably know, which is
our distinguished lecturers uh, is Reinhardt and Mueller. Come on up, Reinhardt. So, uh, thank you, Don. Uh, I would like, I mean, to uh, recognize the EDK volunteers and uh, hardworking uh, people to keep the society uh, more alive. Uh, this is uh, people who serve in the board of governance of the society. So, I'd like to call uh, Ryan Mark Walter. This is a recognition for serving as for the governor in 2016, 2018. Brian? <laughs> uh, the next uh, board of governor who served in 2016 see from these awards is IEEE really values its members and values those members that also contribute to the betterment of an advancement of technology for the benefit of humanity. As VP of conferences, I 
I'd like to appeal to you to also be involved in the organization of these conferences in all aspects of it. So after this event, feel free to get a hold of me and we can talk about how you can become uh, a part of the ecosystem and the friendship that I truly brings to everyone, an advancement in, in knowledge and uh, benefit to humanity. Um, one person that needs to be recognized is the one who has actually led the organization of this event, of ICCE 2019 in Las Vegas. And I call upon Anandaban Sengupta back on stage to receive recognition from the world members. is conferred to the Board of Directors upon a person with an extraordinary record of accomplishments in any of the IEEE fields of interest. IEEE bylaws define the qualifications, the elevation to fellow grade in terms of unusual distinction to the professional, an outstanding record of accomplishments, advancements of application to engineering, science and technology. Okay, next slide is the most important bringing the realization of significant value to society. The elevation to fellow grade is a competitive process with the bylaws defining the maximum number of elevations as 0.1%. One in a thousand people. As such, it's not possible to define a precise closed set of criteria that ensures elevation as everyone is different. Today we acknowledge two successful nominations processed through the IEEE Consumer Electronic Society Fellow Evaluations Committee, who performed expert assessments on candidates, directly contributing to 40% of their overall assessment. So today, I have great pleasure in acknowledging the elevation of Professor Wang Chun Kao for leadership in the development of electrophoretic display technology. So the IEEE Consumer Electronics Society Awards Committee is tasked with assessing candidates for our TAB Awards, our Technical Activities Board. These are the uh, Chester Sol Memorial Awards, the Outstanding Service and the Significant Achievement Awards. So to the Sol. Chester W. Sol Memorial Awards are a set of awards that recognise the best papers 
published in the ITW Transactions on Consumer Electronics. There's a first place, a second place, and a third place best paper award, and it's presented at the next ICCE. These awards consist of impressive IEEE plaque and a, a small financial award. <laughs> it may, may pay for lunch. <laughs> the 27 Sol Award is assessed in the papers published November 2016 to August 2017, assessed over the 2018 period, which gives you an idea of how rigorous this is, and then presented in January 2019. It's assessed by averaging scores across committee member assessors. So I have great pleasure to present our third place award to Hassan Azkin, Erkan Kalali, and Aika Hamzabu. someone who actually really doesn't need any introduction at all. Uh, so our second place goes to Somaz, Joanne Bakhti, Sabeta Zinger and Peter DeWitt for fast scene analysis in surveillance and video databases. has won this award the most of anyone, uh, six times. So that, that's absolutely incredible. Well done, Peter. Yeah. And our first place award goes to Jose Herrera, Carlos de Blanco, and Narcisto Garcia for a novel 2D and 3D video conversion system based on a machine learning approach. Michael couldn't be here today, so we actually gave that to him two days ago, two days ago for outstanding contribution to a broad range of important activities in the Extreme Electronic Society, including the awards committees, ATSC representation, and ICC technical reviews. Michael has been contributing for over 30 years, so I'm sure that you also agree with me that that must be outstanding service. Thank you. Thank you. 
¿Quién se ha dejado aquí el Apple? Yo creo que será de... ¿Y si te gusta? Iba a decir, pues es que un ruso, totalmente. Ah, pues entonces sí. de los que han... Se puede ser de No, ni, ni mirarlo. Sí, pues ahora tengo que meterlo en la maleta. Sí,